Our Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you because as we have come, you are going to teach us your word. We are asking that what you teach us today will become practical in our lives in Jesus' name. We pray that as we study this word week by week and day by day, that what you want it to be, we shall be in Jesus' name. Amen. Guide us in what we study today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are thinking of Acts of the Apostles. We have met a number of individuals who yielded their lives to the Lord and they were used of God. You've um, learnt about Peter, we've learnt about the apostles, we've learnt about the seven that were chosen in Acts of the Apostles chapter 6. And um, of them we have studied Stephen, a man that glorified the Lord and did what he was supposed to do all to the glory of God. And now we have come to the study of one of the great characters in Acts of the Apostles, Philip. And it's in the Acts of the Apostles called Philip the Evangelist. I've told you already that the church in Jerusalem was scattered because of the persecution that arose in Jerusalem after the death of Stephen. But then, as I have told you, persecution can never stamp out, cancel out the church of the Lord. Because Jesus Christ had said, on this rock, Upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. And even though persecution arose in Jerusalem, the seed has been planted. The gospel had been preached. The church had been established. It is true that some of the members of the church were scattered out of Jerusalem, but the church in Jerusalem remained. The apostles were still there. And uh, by the time you come to Acts of the Apostles, 20, uh, 21st chapter, 22nd chapter, you read of a multitude, thousands of believers in Jerusalem. And the work continued. But for now, as they scattered the believers, all abroad, throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, the preaching of the gospel continued. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. In verse 5, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. I told you that the word preaching in verse 4, in the original Greek, is different from the word preach in verse 5. In verse 4, it's talking about every believer passing the word around. It's talking about every believer preaching the gospel, teaching the people, and telling them of Jesus Christ who came and died for our sins, and through him we can be saved, and many were getting saved. And in verse 5, the word is to proclaim, like a public speaker, like an evangelist, like a person standing before a crowd, a multitude of people presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ unto them. And we're told Philip went down to the city of Samaria and he preached Christ. In verse 12, we're told of um, the message that he preached. And when they believed, Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. In verse 35, we're told then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So then from all these we learn together that he was reading the Bible to them, preaching from the scriptures. He was interpreting those scriptures to them and from there he was talking about Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, who came to take away our sins. Now in verse um, 5, he acted as an evangelist. He preached the gospel. In verse 6 and verse 7, 
And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taking with palsies, and that were lame were healed. I thought I'll be able to spend uh, some time on verses 6 and 7 and tell you the authority of the believer against evil spirits, the power that has been given to every believer against um, powers of darkness. But for now, it seems the Lord would like us to just continue in our study. As the Lord gives the opportunity, I'll come back to those uh, verses or give you a series on what the believer can do to preserve himself against any touch, any influence or attack of evil spirits. For now, we'll continue to study in this chapter. But I want to point out this, that the preaching of the gospel had been carrying on in Jerusalem. If you will check up very well, all the seven men that were chosen, the first of them was Stephen. And we're told of his method. He reached out in the synagogues and the temples and he presented the gospel of Jesus Christ unto the people. But then when um, Philip got into Samaria, there was no synagogue, there was no temple in which he would preach. And yet he preached Jesus Christ unto them. And great was the result. I'll show you why. But then I want you to understand this. That as he went out, and he preached and proclaimed the name of Jesus Christ and the gospel of the kingdom and things pertaining to the kingdom, he did something that the church ought to be looking into today. As there was no synagogue, as, was, as there was no temple to get into, yet he preached the gospel with great result. Let us learn. Because you will discover that from place to place, the methodology, the methods you use in preaching the gospel may change. From time to time, the methods that are used in presenting the gospel may change. Now listen to me. It appeared as if it, the people in authority were the people that actually scattered them. Now if you are not studying the Bible too closely and too deeply, you will think that the persecution will stop the preaching of the gospel entirely. And you will think that, well, now that they were scattered and they ran away from Jerusalem, is that not the attitude of a coward? But look at chapter 8 verse 1 again. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Judea and Samaria. Judea and Samaria. Now, keeping on uh, those two words in your mind, Judea and Samaria, come to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And ye, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria. Those two places again, Judea and Samaria. That was the plan of the Lord. That was the commission of the Lord. That was the strategy of the Lord. They were to go into Judea and Samaria. But now the persecution came, and it was the persecution that drove them, drove them into Judea and Samaria. What do we learn from that? Now the persecution may make the church to change its method. But then, in the plan of God, in the will of God, that change of plan is known to God. Now there are times when in a city, and um, the thing you knew how to do was just to preach in the bus. But then uh, there may be a regulation that makes it um, uh, difficult, impossible, unnecessary to not preach in the bus. And you change your method. For the average person who is a Christian, who is not studying the Bible, who does not know the ways of the Lord, the marvelous, mysterious ways of God, how God will move the church to follow the plan of God through the circumstances, they will say, well, doesn't that mean the church is a coward? Doesn't that mean if they say now you mustn't preach in the bus and you change the method and you emphasize another method, don't you think that, is, that means the church is a coward? Well, you know they were scattered out of Jerusalem. 
And they were not adamant to remain in that Jerusalem and do what the people said they didn't want them to do in Jerusalem. The apostles were there. And a few of the believers remained behind in preaching the gospel in Jerusalem. But then the, the scattered disciples, they were scattered to the place the will of God had determined in the past. And you know, this has been a concern of my heart. That the church will open her mind, her heart, her spirit, and her eyes to see what the Lord is saying through whatever regulations and whatever laws may be coming up. When the persecution came and they were scattered, they were scattered into the right place, Judea and Samaria. And you might think when there is no opportunity to preach in the bus, either you fight it out, and God is not leading us in this church to do that. He's just leading us to examine the other possibilities which have been neglected. Writing letters and preaching the gospel. Over the telephone, preaching the gospel. Getting to a friend and telling your testimony. Distributing tracts and uh, giving them the gospel message. And distributing uh, the miracle revival news that the church is publishing so that people can get the gospel to the uh, can get the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when the church is doing that, and we're not doing what uh, we have been doing before uh, on uh, on the bus, are we not cowards? No, not at all. You know, when these uh, people in the church, when they left Jerusalem and they were scattered, they were scattered right into the center of the will of God, of the will of God. That's why it's good to have a leader in the church. Because without a leader in the church, you wouldn't know what to do. You will think if we, if we leave off that thing, that may be a sign of being a coward. But now, that wasn't a sign of being a coward. It was just listening to the Lord and following the Lord. And so they did. They went to Judea and Samaria. Now, Philip came into Samaria. What was he to do? Now, the people in Samaria were God-fearing people. They feared God. It is true that they were doing some things that were wrong. It is true that the Jews did not accept them. But then they were God-fearing people. Because the woman that Jesus Christ met at the well, uh, in one of the villages and the cities of Samaria, you know what she said? She said, I perceive thou art a prophet. How did she know a prophet? By the dressing, not at all. Because at the time that Jesus was asking for water, she, she said, how is it you are a Jew and you're asking me for water? But then Jesus revealed something in her life. And from that evidence, the grace, the gift, the ministry, the supernatural in the life of Jesus, making use of the gift of the word of knowledge and talking about something the woman knew that was a personal problem to her. The woman said, I perceive, I perceive you are a prophet. They were God-fearing people. They were not worshipping God aright, but they were God-fearing people. And then, when Jesus, when she brought up a question about, about worshipping, now because they were worshipping on this side, and you just said on that other side, should we worship? What do you say to that? And then Jesus gave her an answer. Well, she said, I don't know about that answer, but this I know, that the Messiah is coming. And when that Messiah comes, he will tell us all things. The people in Samaria were expecting the Messiah. They didn't know he had come, but they were expecting the Messiah. And so they were God-fearing people. Now, Philip got there. About two Sundays ago, somebody in the second service asked a question. And that question led me to give this explanation and this answer. You might not have been there because most of us here this evening, we attend the first service. And this is the answer that came out. That in Matthew chapter 18, in the preaching of the gospel, according to Matthew, sorry, chapter 16, chapter 16, verse 19, and I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And I pointed out to the people on Sunday, just a week ago, that the Lord has given to the church the keys in the plural, the keys of the kingdom. 
what do you use keys for? To open doors. And the people of this world are in separate compartments, different compartments. For them, it may be a social compartment, and there is a door, there is a door, on, from in which uh, at the, at behind that door they are hiding, and the door is locked. And if you are an evangelist and you are going to preach the gospel, if you have the message of the Lord and you are going to preach it, you need to determine what door is uh, uh, locking them inside in their compartment and there is a key out of a bunch of keys given to the church the keys of the kingdom and you use that key and you'll open the door sometimes it's a door of um, academics you know there are people that are just bookworms and all they learn is philosophy and science and technology and uh, as they are on as they are uh, behind the closed door of their technology now you need to have the key and the, the Lord has given the key to the church and you open that door, they will come out and receive the gospel. But then there are idol worshippers. There are idol worshippers. All they know is power. And um, if you go to them and you talk science, they are not going to repent because you are talking science. Because these are idol worshippers and they are in their idolatrous compartment and the door is locked and the only key that will open that door is the power to heal the sick, to cleanse the lepers, to raise the dead and to cast out devils and there are tribal keys and uh, these people they just say well our forefathers are right and these forefathers what they did is what we are going to do and they are locked behind the tribal door but if the church will look at the key in her hands you'll find that there is a key in that bunch of keys that will open that door and you know that's what philip did that's what philip did he came into that city and he came in as he came in he came in with the keys of the kingdom and he checked up what will get the people will bible study get them no because they did not believe in the um, infallibility of the scriptures they did not have Levites teaching them the word of God. They knew there was God. They knew the Messiah was coming. But they didn't know anything about the authority, the inerrancy, the infallibility of the scriptures. He couldn't start there. What, what was he going to do? Was he going to give illustrations about science, about technology, about, you know, just uh, be logical and preach and preach and preach? with logic, with science, with illustration, with a great message. That wasn't the key for them. What was the key? He saw they were sick. He saw they were lame. He saw they were having many, many problems. Many of them were possessed with evil spirits. You know the key? Just drive out those spirits. Just heal the sick and work those miracles. And as they performed those miracles, look at verse 6. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. That's the thing that got them. You know why? That was the thing that got them. Look at verse 9. In that city, there was a certain man called Simon which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria giving out that himself was a great one to whom they all gave heed from the least even to the greatest saying this man is the great power of God that was the man at the door of that city Simon the sorcerer he had bewitched them. He had manifested the power of the devil. He had manifested uh, the power that will work some magic. And everybody in the town, from the least to the greatest, they were talking about power. And uh, Simon convinced them and told them, I am the great power of God. God's power. That was his name. And you know, as he mentioned that he was uh, the great power of God, uh, you know, all that they were thinking about was power, power, power. And if uh, Philip came and he was just preaching doctrine, 
just interpreting the Bible alone without showing them the real power, the true power, the genuine power coming from God, the door will not be open. Uh, Simon will still stay at the door and he will say, well, there is nothing to that. It's only message, no miracle. It's only talk. It's only logic. But there is no supernatural because the, everybody in the city, from the least to the greatest, they said that is the power of God. That is the power of God. And in verse, um, in verse 11, to him they, they had regard, great regard, because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. And so when Philip came in, the Spirit of God led him, and he knew the key that will open the door, the key of miracles, signs. And wonders and today the church must be as reasonable and you know that there are times when it is just miracle healing deliverance that will touch the hearts of the people now listen to me the Lord has been leading us in this church and the Lord has been giving us the keys you think about it the other churches before we started they didn't understand what evangelism was all about all they, they did crusade they thought that was all about evangelism but the lord gave us the key and we knew the key that will open the campuses and we went on the campuses and the, the students were giving their lives to the lord we went to the secondary schools and there was a key and when we have retreats for school children, we have thousands of them that come together, come into listen. Why? Because we have discovered the key that will open the door to the hearts of those students. We, we discovered it and we used the key to open the door and they came to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And um, you know that uh, the people, uh, there are some people in our community who never go to church ordinarily. Maybe they go on uh, at Easter and then at Christmas And uh, they are the people at the top You know they have the money, they have everything So what are they looking for again? But then the Lord gave us the key And um, when you come on Thursday You see many types of cars outside Some types of cars that uh, you don't even know the make And you don't know the name And it's so fantastic and so big why? Because there is a key that has opened the door to bring those people out of their houses to come and listen to the word of God. And that key is a miracle. The miracle power of the Lord. And the last week, we had a program. Now, think about it. Have you heard of any other church in this country that will do what we did last uh, week? and get um, rent out a place a public place with air condition and everything going fine there and have more than one thousand of people at the higher uh, category of life at the higher cadre and have them come together and they sat inside and they sat outside and we gave them music and we gave them the word they came in large number that is the key that's what we're talking about and you know that as god is leading this church if you're a member of the church you want to be very very careful very very careful because um, the key that will open a university door may be different from the key that will open a mechanics shop and a good pastor, a good teacher, a good evangelist, a good person that the Lord has raised up to win the, to win the lost and so to save souls will determine what key will open that particular door and bring the people to the kingdom of God. And if uh, when such things are going on, you sit on the fence and you criticize and you oppose and say, what is this that they are doing? Why are they using different methods for different people? Shouldn't we be wise? Don't you know that different keys open different doors? And if you are going to get into the hearts of the people, you need to pray, you need to find out. And this church has found out God has given us the keys of that kingdom and we're using the different keys on the different doors and they are coming in. And so when Philip came into this Samaria, 
because the, the thing they were emphasizing in Samaria was the power of God. The thing they were emphasizing in Samaria was miracles, but all they had was magic from, uh, from the sorcerer, from Simon. And so the Lord sent him, and he went down, and he just did the right thing. And they all with one accord gave heed unto those things which he spake, seeing and uh, hearing the miracles which he did. And I'm telling you all this so that when the leadership of this church, when I stand up here, and I tell you that you don't uh, do what is going on, uh, you don't uh, preach in the bus, because that is what the regulation at present says from uh, the government, you will respect the leader. And uh, I didn't only tell you that, but I gave you the key and to witness. I told you to witness and to talk to other people and to do things in a way that souls will still be one. And uh, if you're a real child of God, a good member of the church, and you are following the Bible, and you accept leadership as the Bible wants to accept, wants you to accept leadership, you will not criticize, you will not grumble, and you will not oppose and say, well, I don't understand what they're doing. Whether you understand or not, we are opening the door and the souls are coming in. Every time when you come on Thursday, don't you yourself see the crowd that comes in? What brought them? Well, because the door has been opened. We discovered the key. Miracles. Deliverance. Healing. And as we use that key, every Thursday, the people are coming and they are listening to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought to be wise and use what the Lord has given to the church. And also as we do other programs, all you need to do is to pray along with the church and not oppose the church, sit on the fence criticize, oppose, and say, well, I don't understand why they are using the television now to preach the gospel. That's one of the keys, and it's getting into the hearts of the people, and the people are responding, and they are coming to the Lord in some good number. That's the key the Lord has given to the church. And so, Philip, he got into Samaria, and uh, as he did this, the people, they came. But then let me read the whole thing to you. I've read from verse 9 to verse 12 already. From verse 13 now. Simon himself believed also. And when he, had, he was baptized, he continued with Philip, wondering, he wondered and beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles that were, which were Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was falling upon none of them. Only they, had, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw the throat laying on of the hands of the apostles, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. For thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. Now, I'll not be able to interpret the whole thing to you today. We'll continue next Monday. But I want to tell you this before we pray. That the evangelist went out and he did a great work. Marvelous work. But then they heard in Jerusalem. He was not hiding what he did at Samaria from the leaders in Jerusalem. He was not independent. He was not autonomous. He sent back to his center to Jerusalem, and the people in Jerusalem heard what was going on. Philip was not trying to build a personal separate empire, wanting a great name for himself. That wasn't his reason for preaching the gospel. 
he wasn't uh, wanting to be called uh, a great man a great man oh no that wasn't what he wanted and therefore he linked up with jerusalem and if you are a good uh, person a good member of the church reading the word of god you will be in fellowship of the church listen to me whenever there is something inside your heart that is critical that wants to be separated you may say well they don't understand me you may say well i just want to keep to my way but there is something wrong with you you know the prayer jesus prayed that they all may be one even as thou art in me and i in you and you know that whenever you have a problem like that everything the church is doing you may have something against it if we sing you may say we're singing too loud or you may say we're singing too long but the only thing is that there's something wrong within you and because of that you're critical philip wasn't like that you know philip didn't grudge the people in jerusalem saying well we were all scattered and here we are the lord is working mightily here and they are still staying in jerusalem and there was nothing critical within him and so he allowed the people in jerusalem to come and peter and john came you know when they came they helped him a lot because the work of an evangelist is limited to just drawing the people from the world and bringing them to the kingdom an evangelist is not necessarily a pastor he may not be able to just sit down and counsel the people and teach the people and bring the people to maturity now evangelist is not a necessarily a teacher and because he may not be a teacher he may not know to teach them the doctrine step by step line upon line precept upon precept that is why the evangelist will need both the pastor and the teacher to complement his ministry to complete the work that he has started an evangelist may not be an apostle because uh, the apostle is the one that comes in with great power and great authority and is able to hold everything together i told you that before and then an evangelist may not be a prophet but god has given to the church he gave some apostles he gave some prophets he gave some evangelists he gave some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of christ until we all come in the unity of faith to the measure of the stature of the fullness of christ and um, if philip did not allow the apostles to come the church will not grow in samaria and that is something you ought to understand because you know sometimes young people young people because you have had a dream you've got a vision that is burning in your heart there's a zeal within you you want to rise up and do something that's all right but then do it in the proper way because you know if you isolate yourself if you become independent you are not going to be able to do it don't hurt yourself don't cut off the nose to spite the face you need the apostle you need the prophet you need the evangelist and you need the pastor you need the teacher for the perfecting of the saints and you need you know your the members of your family they all need all these ministries in the church and uh, you cannot be perfect without all these ministries that the lord has set in the church and um, plant where there is rain where the rain is falling if you know rain is falling somewhere and you need water bring your bucket out put it where the rain is falling hey, don't uh, say well that area where the rain is falling i have something against that place and i don't ever want to go to that place be wise bring out your bucket where the rain is falling where the power of god is moving where the miracles are going on where the deep teaching of the world is going on where you see very clearly very clearly the signs the authority the power of the apostle where you see the insight and the supernatural gift that is given to the prophet of god and where you see the work of the pastor being done counseling and loving and they just uh, shepherding and feeding the flock and where you see the teacher of the doctrine of the word of god teaching you laying it line upon line bring your bucket out while the rain is falling that's what uh, philip did he wasn't bearing any grudge of the people in um, in, uh, in in jerusalem let me help you you see i am your pastor i am your teacher and uh, as your pastor and as your teacher sometimes you'll find things easy when you hear the word of god sometimes you'll find something e the things easy when you are healed when you are when you are joyful when you are happy but listen to me as a pastor there are times i just have to be very strict with you 
I may discipline you. Now, you cannot bear grudge with a pastor because it's, it's not a personal thing. It's not well, uh, so and so has offended me. A pastor does not offend a member of the church like that. We are not fighting over uh, you stole my shirt or you did something. All that we're doing here is that as your pastor, if there is something that needs to be corrected in your life, I have to be firm and strict and authoritative. And I tell you, my brother, my sister, this is where to stand. You don't bear grudge with the pastor and say, well, I will not, uh, anytime I will not go there to that place, you can do that. You can't do that. I will not bring my children to that place. You can't do that. Bring out your bucket where the rain is falling. And don't uh, be a grudge against the pastor and don't be critical. And uh, well, I have nothing to do with him. You don't mean it. You don't mean it. Because if God has given a driver in the vehicle and you are in that vehicle, if you are going to get to the destination, don't fight with the driver. If the pilot of that airplane is, uh, is making you to go to that place, to the far country, to the far country, you don't fight with the pilot and say, well, I have something against him. Now when that man is telling you to tighten your belt, and to look at the signs and showing you all those things and say well it's bothering me oh yes it will bother you that's his duty and as a pastor i have to bother you sometimes i have to just uh, uh, talk to you very seriously and you can't say well i have nothing to do with those people anymore you can't do that you can't do that don't hurt yourself the rain is falling bring your bucket out now and uh, philip he was in samaria and as he was there he, he allowed these people to come, you know, to come, and as they came, you know what happened? They laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Suppose Philip had not allowed these men of God to come from Jerusalem. That church will remain immature, immature. Apart from that, Simon the sorcerer, who was converted and was baptized, and was following after Philip all the time, he had backslidden, and Philip didn't know. But then the apostles came and they had a separate, a different, a higher, a greater anointing and power and insight. And they, they plowed in the, into the supernatural because the authority of an apostle is totally different from the authority of an evangelist. Uh, they, are far be, they, they, are far, uh, they are far apart. And now Simon came and, and offered money. Now when he wanted to see the apostles, he didn't know them before but philip did not hinder him the zonal leader should not hinder anybody from seeing the general superintendent the pastor of the church because the zonal leader cannot be all and all in all for the people because there is an anointing on the pastor there is a power within the pastor and there is an insight on the man of god on the prophet of god that is beyond the anointing and the power and the insight and the authority of the zonal leader and the philip recognized that and he allowed uh, someone said i'd like to see these people he didn't uh, say well what do you want to see them for that you cannot talk to me about well he just said, okay if you want to go to them they are apostles they are the leaders from the headquarters and they will help you more oh yes you can see them anything you want to see them upon and then um, simon just uh, spoke out and he said give me this power he wanted to go from a new convert to an apostle immediately so that anybody i lay my hands upon the person will just receive the holy ghost i'll just be an apostle overnight they saw pride there they saw evil in his heart. They saw that what was happening to him was that he was a great man before that had commanded a large crowd. And now he had, lived, he had left all that. He had, is now in the Christian fold. And he wants to have the same large crowd again using this power in a dubious way, in a doubtful manner. And uh, Peter looked at him. And he saw something beyond the, uh, beyond the physical. He saw something beyond, this, the, beyond the surface. And he said, your heart is not right with God. You are in the God of bitterness. You are in the, in the pool of iniquity. Your, many, your money perish with you. And Simon began to shake. And he said, you pray for me. That all this will not happen to me. 
My question to you is this. Suppose the apostles had not come. Suppose the apostles were not in Jerusalem, in, in Samaria. What would have happened? Simon would have backslidden and it would have continued like that and when somebody backslides like that who had an evil spirit before Jesus Christ said he will, the evil spirit will go and it will cause seven more wicked spirits and come into the heart of the man and the last state of that man is worse than the beginning and Philip may not know Philip may not know now you are zonal leaders you don't hide anything that is going on in the zone because if that a lady that had familiar spirit before and got converted and had been baptized in water and had been going up and down in the zone if she backslides and you don't know about it and you are hiding her if she backslides seven more wicked spirits may come into her and then you will think think she's a worker but um, if the pastor comes there the man of god with prophetic ministry and anointing upon him those people cannot hide it they cannot hide it and then with the apostolic authority we will be able to say now woman or lady your heart is not right with god and you know that is what helped her feeling because even though he did not know himself he allowed the apostles to come in and they completed the work they did what he couldn't have done and so in the work that the lord has committed into our hands we need to open up and we need to understand that you mustn't uh, hold on to yourself or be selfish to yourself or say well i have nothing to do with the whole church you don't want to do that you don't want to ruin yourself you don't want to be angry or bitter against the pastor think about it think about it if you read in the bible that anybody was angry bitter critical against paul the apostle and when Paul the Apostle came to town, this individual said, Well, I will not go to Paul the Apostle because uh, I, um, I don't like him. <laughs> Wouldn't you wonder what type of person that is? Think about it. When Joshua was leading the children of Israel, suppose there was somebody among the children of Israel that said, Well, I just don't like the way Joshua is doing things. Therefore, I'm still a good member of the church and I'm still going to be among the children of Israel. But have nothing to do with joshua wouldn't you think how foolish that is suppose uh, when uh, peter was right there in the church in jerusalem there were people that said well i didn't like i don't like the way he dealt with the case of anna and sapphira and because of that i have nothing to do with him i'll just come to church and go my way and it's avoiding peter wouldn't you think that is a foolish person listen to me moses is not here now Joshua is not here, Peter is not here, Paul is not here. Let me ask you. Jesus said that he gave gifts. And Paul the apostle wrote it down. He said he gave gifts some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. I stand here before you every time. I minister before you every time. If you are looking for the signs of a prophet in the New Testament, haven't you seen it every Thursday? If you're looking for the sign of a real teacher, I'm not talking of Sunday school teacher, a person that has the teaching and the anointing to teach. If you're looking for that, haven't you seen that as I have given you the word of God every time? And if you're looking for a pastor, a pastor able to build the church, able to get the church coordinated together, able to love the people, able to counsel, able to help the people, able to get the people together and feed them week after week, haven't you seen the sign upon the person the Lord has put in this church? Paul is not going to come back. Peter is not going to come back. And uh, if you are here now, you know that God has given you a teacher and a pastor, an evangelist and a prophet to teach you the word of God. Now, if you are wise, you cannot say, well, I have nothing to do with them. I will just go to church and come out. I am critical. I am separated. I am independent. Don't hurt yourself. Why should you do that? When that is happening and you are separated like that and detached like that, independent and autonomous like that, isn't there something wrong? What has the man of God done? 
if the man of God is correcting you in your marriage, isn't it for your good if the man of God is correcting you in your dressing? Isn't it for your good if the man of God is correcting you for your behavior? Is it not for your good? Is it not so he can take you to heaven as we are joined to heaven? Why be foolish and be arrogant and be critical and say, well, I will just stay by myself. You can't do it if you are going to make it at last. Now in Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13. I'm looking at verse 7. Remember them which have been ruled over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you, and submit yourselves. Listen to me. If I rebuke you, as your pastor, as your teacher. And because of that, you pull back, you run away. Is that obedience? Is that submission? Wouldn't you rather be smitten by a righteous man? Wouldn't that be ointment upon your head? For they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy. And not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. And if you're any member of this church, who may not be here tonight, but you've not seen them for some time, and you check off from them and you say, Brother or sister, we've not seen you for some time, and they reply you, they say, Well, uh, I'm sorry, I love the Lord, but uh, I don't like uh, how that church is going on because uh, the pastor in the church, he was rude to me. You tell him, The pastor is never rude to anybody. I'm your father in the Lord, however old you are. The father is never rude to the children. I can correct you, I can rebuke you privately or publicly. That's not being rude, that's guiding you, that's helping you. And the Bible says, you obey, you submit. And when you do that, aren't you happy there is somebody watching for your soul? Outside there in other churches, they watch for your money. Over here, we watch over your soul. And we are trying to help you the best we can. So don't be critical. Bear the burden. Bear the yoke. Bear the rebuke. And if there is anybody you know is not wanting to bear the burden and bear the rebuke, you talk to those people to be reasonable and to follow after the Bible. All that we are saying tonight is that Philip was not independent. And uh, none of us in this church should be independent. Let us work together. And even when you are corrected, when you are rebuked, don't draw back because of that. Rise up and let us pray. To share. And that's what we needed. And you tell the Lord. Open your mouth and open your heart. Talk to the Lord. Tell the Lord you will not be critical. Don't be independent. Don't be autonomous. And if the rain is falling, and it is falling, the rain of the Spirit of God, bring your bucket out. Don't say, well, I don't like that place where the rain is falling. You see the miracles that God is performing every Thursday. You see the great things that's doing every Sunday and every Monday. You bring your bucket out while the rain is falling. Don't draw back. 